you know, and the classical music, I, I just started to understand it much later. I always, I always felt something about it, but much deeper, much, mm. much more in my subconscious, maybe, you know, um, and not, not in my, in my awareness, in my momentum. Mm. It was doing something with me, but you know, when I would hear, for example, Michael Jackson, or when I would hear Miles Davis or Wayne Charter, I had this immediate uh, enthusiasm when I was listening to that. Nick, um, well, I saw I saw on Instagram that um, you are a creator, an educator, and I see you. Do you play the saxophone as well? Yes, I mostly play the saxophone. I would call this my main instrument since I mm -hmm. have solved my bachelor's and my master's by studying the jazz saxophone. But mm -hmm. uh, throughout the years, I was like studying many instruments. For example, uh, the jazz faculty in Graz uh, has a curriculum that is like full of very nice, uh, nice things to learn. For example, you have to learn a lot of side instruments such as uh, flute, clarinet, drums, piano. And uh, so clarinets also include the bass clarinet, for example. Um, flutes, in my case, include also a bass flute or an alto flute, which I got very interested with. And I also was really interested with um, Eastern instruments such as uh, the duduk, that is like oh. uh, being played a lot in Armenian music, for example, or also in, in Arabesque music sometimes, or also in Indian music, yeah? Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of instruments on my path uh, that really? were like... Mm. getting into my way and yeah. also into my music and yeah yeah and but, so from 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 saxophone then is it easy to learn all these other instruments to me saxophone was a really good bass frame mm. actually my first instrument was uh, the flute uh, recorder so my mother she's a recorder teacher and uh, when i was three years old she was really, she was getting really annoyed, I guess, by my percussive uh, keyboard playing. Oh, so okay. She gave me a <laughs> recorder, and yeah. she was like, "Try that. It's not, it's not so, you know, <laughs> you cannot yeah. play that percussively." Um, and she taught me the notes, and she taught me how to write music and how to read music. So I had more of a basic musical education um, mm -hmm. uh, by my mother, and. When I was like uh, seven or eight years old, I switched to saxophone. I would have my first uh, teacher at the local music school of my hometown. And I would uh, study saxophone with two different teachers for like 10 years. Oh, really? So where is your hometown? My hometown is uh, called, uh, actually, a it's a village. It's a very small village that is very yeah. well known for its wine. <laughs> yeah. It's called Rech. And it's in southeast Syria, which is like close to the city of Bad Radkesburg. Okay. This city is for example, my high school yeah. city, Bad Radkesburg. Oh, I see. And um, yeah, so that was the from the recorder to the to the saxophone, and then you say then you started being interested in all other flutes as well. I was joining um, with fourteen. I was joining an orchestra, the orchestra mm -hmm. of my hometown. And I remember the conductor told me, you know, we don't we don't have saxophone players. We do have clarinet players that are also able to play the saxophone. So pick yourself a clarinet and learn it. So I picked it and learned oh, it. Okay. I was yeah. not really motivated. I was not really into clarinet. But mm -hmm. my, my grandfather used to be a, a clarinet player. He still is, but he's not mm -hmm. playing anymore. <laughs> yeah. So this was like my tender motivation to... <laughs> Mm. to you know learn it and but obviously i was teaching it to myself pretty wrong or maybe mm. in a very fragmented way i just tried to play the way how i play saxophone and mm. that's not working because it's a different instrument it, it might be oh, it's familiar. Yeah. the saxophone is just a development out of the clarinet right mm. because adult sax back in the days he was like um not happy with the fact that in the marching band you need like 20 clarinet players to be as loud as three trumpet players so he just decided 
to fusion those two instruments basically. Oh, I, and that's oh the really? Main saxophone, yeah. And um, yeah, so anyways, I I was teaching it to myself, uh, yeah. not hundred percent correctly. And when I was like attending the clarinet classes at university, mm -hmm. my teacher was really really hard on me, so oh, that really? I could yeah. start from zero again and. You yeah. know, there is like um, there are two different kinds of clarinets, like the main kinds that are played here in Europe, the French clarinet or mm -hmm. the Bohemian clarinet and the German clarinet. And oh, they're okay. different in theory, mm -hmm. and also their tone is different. So the German clarinet sounds much more nasal, maybe, like a little bit ducky, and yeah. it's more sharp, it's more like it has more punch, and it fits perfectly for example for for austrian folk music you need mm. this energy there you need this nearly penetrant frequencies to, to to be able to be loud enough with the other instruments in in this blend you know mm. and then there's the french clarinets that is like it has more of a warm sound mm. um, it's also used for jazz and pop productions not just for classical music and okay. it's also yeah it's, it's like a bit different Mm -hmm. And it helped me to, to learn uh, the clarinet from zero again, because the second time I learned clarinet, I oh, would okay. pick the, the French <laughs> clarinet. So oh, I see. It was uh, like really a new start for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and then, uh, yeah, please. No, but did you also always, um, uh, uh, you played jazz, not, not really classical, or were you classically trained all, all the time? Um, I was both. I, I was classically trained in the beginning, um, but my teacher was, when he was realizing that I have a lot of passion and enthusiasm for swing, he would uh, organize uh, a jazz or a swing school for me. Uh, it's called Lenny Niehaus. So this was like my first time I was getting in touch with the, with the bad world, with the jazz oh, okay. world. <laughs> and... Um, Mm. And yeah, but I always liked both a lot, uh, even though classical music seemed to be, as a kid, it seemed to be more of a workout for me. I didn't feel it as much as I was feeling jazz, okay. because jazz is much more closer to pop music, right? It, mm. it used to be the last virtuous pop music, maybe, if you want to call it that way. So, um, you know, and classical music, I, I just started to understand it much later i always i always felt something about it but much deeper much mm. much more in my subconscious maybe you know um and not not in my in my awareness in my momentum mm. it was doing something with me but you know when i would hear for example michael jackson or when i would hear miles davis or wayne charter i had this immediate uh, enthusiasm when I was listening mm. to that so and that was different my teacher thought okay this guy is gonna study some jazz with me <laughs> but is there more is there more of that sense of freedom for you in playing jazz freedom yeah you know freedom of, of expression yeah. you know that yeah. I know I know classical music you can express mm -hmm. yourself as well but with jazz almost that you can put more of your uh way of doing it i think the key word is improvisation because improvisation yeah. exists in both fields right in, in mm -hmm. classical music in contemporary music in jazz and always when it comes to improvisation that means freedom but also in jazz i, I play very different and versatile uh, jazz projects so uh, mm -hmm. I, it happens uh, that there's a lot of stuff written out in jazz as well I just had a, a very fun rehearsal uh, one hour, two hours ago. It's, it's a great band, but they're mostly um, mostly everything is is uh, written down. But there are like these spots of freedom, and everyone, every musician would have like his or her spots throughout the the pieces. And I like both. You know, it's it's also a matter for me. Do I always want freedom? Do I always need freedom? I know, I know that sounds uh, that sounds weird, actually, because I no, I, I know what you mean. Yeah, because but it's like eight in the morning, and I I'm sitting in this rehearsal, and like 
I don't know any of those people. And it's like the, the first tune and I'm supposed to play a, a 10 minute free solo. That that's uncomfortable for me. You know, I, I like oh, I to see, warm yeah. up. I like to get yeah. into music and and it's it's also nice to play something that is expected. Mm. But I prefer freedom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I can understand what you mean about you have to be in in something to to um I I think sometimes it's this um this idea between uh i don't know i might be wrong but it's when when you do maths it's there's a right and a wrong way it's yes. it's just like it is but if you say to somebody uh, create then it's when you know you you don't have the the rules or, or yeah, you know, there's nothing to say it's going to be right or it's going to be wrong. It's going to have to come from within you. And I think sometimes that is is difficult. Uh, the difficult thing of art is to 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 have that sort of freedom and you know to to know when you do it right or when it feels right, I think. Exactly, exactly. Improvisation is so relative. It's like it's like, you know, it depends on the momentum. It depends mm -hmm. on who you're playing. Even if you have like frames for improvisation, like even if you have very clear frames, it will sound different every time. It will sound even different if you do it in the like uh, in the same on the same day, you know, maybe even in the same hour. It will always sound different, and that's uh, very special about improvisation. Mm. It's, it's very ah, deep, it's very intuitive, yeah. and it's very, it's very. You're very naked. It's very intimate. Yeah, mm -hmm. mm. Um, you're, you're showing your deepest thoughts, and you can't. You cannot lie. You can actually. You can. I, I think there are a lot of people that are like. Um, uh, they're transcribing a lot, and th that's nothing against transcribing. I, I, lo I love transcribing to understand uh, mm -hmm. other languages. But if it comes to, you know, copy, uh, and to if it comes to playing what you transcribe from someone else, it's not mm -hmm. yourself. That's, that's lying, actually. Mm -hmm. Lying in improvisation, it exists. Um, and it's very hard. They're not, um, yeah, it's very, it's very hard. To be true to yourself actually yeah i can imagine yeah but uh, so are you part of a band yes i i'm part of eight ba bands at the moment uh, and wow. they have pretty much all of them have different um a different genre if you want to mm -hmm. call it genre or uh, maybe a different idea of uh how to sound or uh of of um, instrumentation mm -hmm. and um, yeah of goals different mindset of goals mm -hmm. so today for example I had this um, um, rehearsal with a band called uh, Little Rosie's Kindergarten and yeah. it's like uh, you might know I, I saw you live in Vienna right yes yes so you might know the Porgy and Bass uh, jazz yeah. club yeah yeah so we, we are the stage band uh, in this season, which means that we will play at Porgy and Bass every month with this band. Oh, wow. And that's amazing. Yeah, that's that's very fun. Um, yeah. I really like Porgy and Bass. It's a really great uh, jazz club. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the boss, Christoph Huber, is doing a, really a great job considering like the, the lineup he has. Um, it's mm -hmm. really amazing. He's like both having um, really famous and renowned uh, stars of the scene, but also he's uh, pushing uh, young talents of the of the scene, not just mm -hmm. Vienna, but the whole mid-European scene, and giving them a stage and also, you know, paying them reasonably. Also, mm -hmm. in in lockdown, there were like no people in the concerts, but he was still paying a full gosh, and and that's like, Am you know, I these mean? people are really important mm -hmm. nowadays. That are mm -hmm. really valuing the the work of mm -hmm. an artist, and um, yeah, so. You were warmly welcomed <laughs> to visit us at Porgy and Bess. Oh, that would be amazing. I would love to. Yeah, I would love yeah. to come. And then, so this is the main band that you are part of, or, or you say? Maybe my, the main band is my flagship project, which is called mm -hmm. uh, Nick Cloud's Interdimensional Caucus. <laughs> 
Yeah. And I, I compose for this band um, and and we play, for example, our next gig will be on 10th of October at Jazzwerkstatt Graz uh, Festival. Mm-hmm. And we just played at Kultur Sommer uh, Wien, which was an outdoor festival. And um, there was like a recording session at Radio Ö1 uh, a few months ago that was on air in August. Yeah. So this is like my main project. This is the okay. project that I mm-hmm. invest most of my musical energy, of my creative energy into it. And But I also, for example, I, I play in a, in a reggae band, in a psychedelic reggae band that is very different really? from all the projects yeah. that I have. And uh, it's called Sticker Bush. And uh, it's yeah. really fun. The, the, the people, the other band members, they're all friends. So we're like this yeah. circle of friends that are meeting and uh, um, mostly regularly um, and creating uh, new, new music. And like we are going to release an album very soon that will be called Strictly Jap. <laughs> yeah. And there is also like one thing that I'm really happy about uh, is that I'm part of Christian Mutspiel's orchestra from next year on. So I'm, I'm going to be new to this, to this orchestra. And this is like really big for me. And this is, um, this is a great thing. I really highly respect Christian Mutspiel, his music and... Mm-hmm. His uh, band consists out of some of the best young players that I personally yeah. know in the whole mm-hmm. scene. And so it's it's nice to be, you know, a yes. cherry on his tree. That's amazing. And when will you be joining them? I will be joining them uh, firstly in February uh, of okay. next year. Mm-hmm. We will go to Munich um, to play uh, and, and to record and to rehearse for a whole week mm-hmm. in um Oh, you got to help me now. I don't know what's uh, this uh, Riesenrad. We have the same in Wiener Prater. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. The, this uh, is the... Um, uh, no, I don't know. That, but it's like a big wheel or something. <laughs> yeah, let's call it the big spinning wheel <laughs> of Munich. Yeah. Yeah. It's a fun project because um, all the musicians, and I think it's... Uh, I hope I'm not wrong. I think it's 15 or 17 musicians. They will be yeah. spread into the all those gondols so every oh. musician has a different gondol and yeah. uh, the audience they can join the musicians in the gondol and they will get some headset and they can listen the whole band playing while the spinning wheel is turning <laughs> it's that's a, amazing a yes I'm, what a I'm great idea to... yeah oh that's a great idea i think it's very interesting then you ha- you the, you really up close to the band then yes yes yeah yeah and so again, this is like completely a different uh, project because mm. that's a lot about orchestral mm. jazz music, but also very, very modern and very, very contemporary. And mm. uh, I was just listening, um, you know, uh, your uh, interview with with the harp player Joel um, oh, yeah. before, and uh, when he was like saying like he's not so much into that. Uh, a contemporary thing where they are all shouting and doing sounds and yeah. um, so there will be a lot of elements in this music oh, okay. uh, <laughs> for example which I'm really into yeah <laughs> and um, not only as you can see because I have this reggae band I have my own project that is again yeah. completely different because it used to be uh, the Nicholas Interdimensional Caucus used to be my master thesis uh, basically, mm-hmm. and I was trying to incorporate as much musical style, music styles as possible into one project, like such as uh, you know all the different kinds of Brazilian music. There is such a rich culture of Brazilian music, like styles like maracatu, ishisha, frevo, um, samba, bossa. There's so much, you no, know? and I, I tried to get. 70 music styles all into one project this was the, wow. the my master thesis and mm. and then for example i also play with a lot of hip-hop and neo soul uh, artists mm. such as soul supreme or soya from Vienna, for example and but i also play in, in duos which is like completely different because it's very you know it's like improvisation a little bit every every tone that you play has a lot of space so mm. every tone that you put has has 
a lot of meaning if you want or not but you mm. have to stand behind it you have to own your your tone that you just manifested and yeah. so that's what i like about playing in duo for example with marco da costa brazilian guitarist that i really adore and we will play on uh, jazz liebe festival which is a Styrian festival and this and when this, is that uh that's happening on 5th of november oh okay but do you uh, ever play solo or do I you do like it solo, you do. but yeah i I think I never really had a, a live show. I mean, I play solo for myself, of course, uh, but yeah, I record. Yeah. I record, and I have um, I have a couple of effect uh, pedals, such as this one here, for example. Oh, yeah. And uh, I can loop myself, and I can mm -hmm. put certain effects onto my saxophone or whatever I play, and um, and create something with it. And my plan. Mm -hmm will be like definitely do you know play shows by myself also to bring for example to bring a piano or even bringing this uh, electric drum set that you can see behind there um and some woodwind instruments and to be able to create a whole show to be able to travel by myself uh, mm -hmm. spontaneously also and to be able to stay in a city maybe for a week longer than expected and uh, you know like just being a mm. flexible nomadic <laughs> artist yeah but it's yeah because when you're in a band you always have to to be together to make the music and of course go exactly. yeah Organize. but how, i i want to know now because you if you say you are involved in so many bands and and you are uh, you know so involved in in the music but how do you get to all these places how did you connect from the beginning i mean you must have started out uh you know a single musician and then how do you get to all these bands i think that universities uh, have been a major point of connection mm -hmm. and of social networking because um, there are so many great people at university and you you are not gonna like everyone uh, for their music or for their character but you will find a lot of people that you will link up and that you will bond and that you will be able to create something nicely so this was like the the key point for me but i think also um social media of course because social media uh, also, or also youtube allows you to be connected uh, with artists all over the world you post something and one second later someone in in bangladesh can watch it and yeah. you know what i mean and, yeah. and that's that's beautiful and and i i try to be very active i tr i maybe i even spend too much time with it but i try to be very consistent about showing myself and uh and that helped me a lot to connect and i also um did a lot of things for free but i just thought a lot about yesterday like whenever I did something for free, there was like something coming back to me. Like, um, you know, like in the end, it was not for free. In the end, I would like, um, for example, uh, I, I was uh, recording a few tunes with a singer like uh, half a year ago. And it was a nice production, but there was no budget for it. But I believe in her music. So... I was anyways doing it and and um, playing and then i i meet uh i meet the the um, wife of the studio engineer like randomly because she's into flutes and saxophones and we we got into a conversation it turned out that she's a an actress and a, a direct director and she has her own um film agency uh movie agency so i told her i am really into acting i actually i would have became an actor or I would have studied theater if I wouldn't have studied music. And then she, she found it very cool and she invited me to some workshops. Really? Um, and, and I ended up being an actor now. I just, um, I just had my first uh, cyberpunk action movie uh, production. Oh, wow. Movie. And yeah, it's, it's amazing. You see what I mean? Like even yeah. when you yeah. invest your energy or power, and you, you're not getting paid. And I think if you're also like, you know why you're 
you're doing this, even if it's mm. for free, you, you will get something back for it. Mm. I, I, I made this experience in life for me and that's very beautiful. Mm. And I think that's I think, like... Yeah, I agree with you. I think, um, I think it's a misconception really that you do something for free because you would either uh, gain the experience of it or you would... Uh, you know, build a portfolio or whatever, but I don't, I don't believe in anything in, in the sense of art that you do is really for free. You know, it's either a sense of marketing yourself or building up to something, but it's, um, yeah, I I think I, I always think of it this way, you know, that it's, it's a, it's, um, it's a step towards something. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. But that's great. But I love your energy. You have, you really, it looks like you just um, enjoy life and you enjoy your art and you enjoy the music and create all the time. And um, yes. And yes. now you say, and you're teaching as well? Um, yeah, it was interrupted for a second, so oh, I couldn't sorry. understand. Are you teaching as well? Yes, I also have 33 uh, students at the moment yeah. and uh, they learn um, piano clarinet saxophone mm-hmm. uh, and, and drums with me and I'm, I'm in a public music school um, mm-hmm. one hour away from Vienna so under the week I'm always there and I spend two nights on countryside for teaching and yeah. the rest of the week I spend in Vienna mostly especially uh-huh. now during pandemic usually I'm on tour a lot so mm-hmm. When I, you know, when I, when I'm on tour, I cannot teach that much. But right now, it's perfect for me, and I, I like teaching because uh, it's it feels nice to share something, mm. you know, that uh, you invested a lot into, and and it helps people. And I did other jobs also, and I found out for myself, you know, teaching is a very nice compromise of doing something that is like fertile creative Mm -hmm. but also you're earning frequent money and i you know i need to pay my rent i need to repair all my my 12 instruments from time to time and Mm -hmm. so i need to think about those things and um yeah so Mm -hmm. i stopped playing commercial music i used to play a lot of commercial music also Mm -hmm. and this felt horrible for me i really hated it i i was playing for some <laughs> bands that would uh, be in the in the Austrian charts. Uh, and it was just, yeah, I mean, we can no, switch top. Yeah. <laughs> but so, um, te- yeah, but teaching, I think there's a, there's a musical a film. I, th- I don't know if it was The King and I or where, the, where they uh, sing the song, actually, where uh, the woman says, from your as a teacher from your students you learn a lot and it's actually true i think yeah. by teaching you actually learn something of yourself as well and you learn Absolutely. yeah yeah so i think it's great when you can teach and also you reflect about you try to pass something on that you once learned right yeah so you go deeply into yourself when you prepare for a student and you're like wait a minute hang on how did i learn this actually what what was mm-hmm. i doing because sometimes um, I was I was a lot like I was learning by doing, mm. so you know and that's problematic for a teacher because you cannot tell a student like you know you just have fun you just play and then you will be able to do it sometime. No, yeah. you have to sit down and you have to analyze yourself and you have yeah. to really go go back and and understand how you were figuring out things like, and mm. and that's also very. Uh, it's very good. It's very good. Yeah. That's a good point about teaching. But I, I, um, I ask now uh, all the artists, how do you prepare before a concert? Do you have little rituals or something that you do? I do. I do. You but do? I, I, don't, I don't always am able to uh, keep on with them, which is good because I don't like to be dependent to my rituals. Mm, mm. But whenever I'm able to absolve my rituals, I'm playing much better. Oh, it's okay. like yeah. 
it consists of things like that are very basic actually yeah. which is like the most basic thing is um, having a quality sleep mm -hmm. i for example right now i'm having a huge sleeping deprivation <laughs> because yeah. I, I think i slept like nine hours the last three nights like all together <sighs> Um, because there was like too many jobs and I had to, to practice still after, you know, after being an actor, I still need to practice my instrument. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that, that's the problem of doing two completely different things. Yeah. <laughs> but usually before a concert, I try to get at least six hours of sleep. That's really mm -hmm. important for me. Uh, a healthy breakfast is really important for me to start into a day and to have uh, a certain amount of vitamin C, it's also helping me to be more relaxed, to have less oh, yeah. stress and mm. to have more inner peace. And those are rituals. I like to call them rituals, even though they're so basic, they should be so basic, mm. you know, being sleeping enough, uh, eating healthy. Mm. I'm also vegetarian, so that helps me uh, on, you know, not being so tired <laughs> on the oh, day. Okay. And working. Yeah. So... Yeah, those are my main rituals. And of course, also really important uh, is to, to play the instrument at least at least half an hour before actually playing uh, the oh, concert. Really? This is mm -hmm. really important for me. And I would I would cancel a concert maybe if I'm not able to do that. Really? So I'm, why I'm, is I'm that? I'm exaggerating right now. I would not cancel. Yeah, okay. but, <laughs> no, but um, I, I, why is that important for you? Uh, it's like uh, for being a saxophonist, it's really important to warm up my lip muscles. Oh, I see. Okay. And, yeah. and also the reed, uh, a saxophone reed needs to be wet. If it's dry, mm -hmm. it will sound like a, you won't sound like a saxophone. You will sound more like a duck again. Oh, okay. And, um, yeah, these are some, some things that every saxophonist is doing if they're on a certain level and also trumpet yeah. players for trumpet players this is like highly important if they uh -huh. don't warm up they mm -hmm. will you know after 10 or 15 minutes of playing um you will hear nothing but air coming through oh, there. Okay. <laughs> and um you know for us using our lips for us musicians using the lips it's really important but also i heard it from a lot of piano players from guitar players that they they have those oh, tools. They have to, yeah. They, yes, where they warm up their fingers. And mm. it's either, you know, maybe it's for being able to perform from the first second on when you're on stage, mm. or maybe also to have more stamina actually on, on stage. Oh, okay. Yeah. And play for two or three hours. Uh, it's really important that you warm up. Mm. It's just like at, in sports, you know, if you don't warm up in sports and you, you maybe you play a football match for 90 minutes, you are not going to play it for 90 minutes. You will have some cramps yeah. or you will like need a substitution. Yeah. <laughs> with music. But that's, yeah, but that's interesting. I, did, I didn't realize that, you know, it's these little things that we don't realize if you don't know exactly the instrument. And then how do you wind, wound down afterwards? Like, what do you do, do to relax after the concert? <laughs> Have a beer or a wine? What are you, a beer man or a wine man? I, I don't like beer. I don't drink beer. Never, really? Ever. Yeah. yeah. I like wine. Oh, okay. Like wine. Yeah. The region that I'm from, I, I told you we have very... Oh, yes. You have... <laughs> wines, which yeah. is also problematic sometimes because... I don't like bad wine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I prefer not to drink if there is uh, no good wine. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm South, I'm South Africa and I also come from a wine uh -huh. region. Yeah. So I yeah. understand completely what you mean about yeah, drinking yeah, good yeah. wine. Yeah. <laughs> so I would rather I'm not sorry. I would rather not drink wine if I'm not yeah, sure yeah. at least a good wine. Yeah. I don't want to sound too spoiled, but there's no point. I, yeah. I <laughs> I don't really drink alcohol to get drunk. Um, yeah. Maybe sometimes, but not really. Um, so yeah. it's about the taste, about the aroma. And yeah, yeah and I like to, of course, I like to hang out with, with the people that I performed, yeah. that I performed with. And because I believe that this is also really important for the mm. chemistry on stage. If 
you link up and if you're able to you know socialize and communicate or mm -hmm. talking about some deep things with your bandmates that's yeah it's like a rehearsal yeah yeah sure i mean i i can imagine that it's very important to have this chemistry between you you know in the in the band yes. like that but um so and um, so what is the next now for you when is the next concert the next concert um is on 29th of september i think yeah i have to check yes on 29th of september and it will be um a band the band of abel notch he's a hungarian composer and a really good uh, fusion keyboard player and he put together this huge band it's it's maybe not a jazz big band but it's very close to that oh wow and, mm. and he calls he calls this genre terror funk whatever uh, okay. that is yeah but you can imagine it as like something really high high energy like really high energy is going on there like it's really fast and very pushy and there's a very uh, good drummer um it's like the club will be on fire that's oh is sure. it <laughs> It sounds amazing, but um, well, it was so lovely to talk to you. And uh, I would, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm I'm following you on Instagram, so I'll I'll be watching what you are doing. So, uh, but but let me know if there's anything exciting you would like to talk about. If you start doing your your uh, traveling through Europe, um, uh, <laughs> your one. Uh, what do you call that? Your one, your one man band. Maybe the one tet. Yes. The one. <laughs> yeah. So, but really, anytime you're more than welcome. Let me know if there's something interesting. Then um, it's very interesting to talk to you. Thank you for your interest. Thank you for having me, and I wish you a nice day. And I hope to see you at Porgy. Um, yes. Stay there on eight of. October actually with oh, okay. uh, Little Rose's kindergarten. Okay, but um I will I will have a look. But thank you so much, Nick. That was so lovely to talk to you. And I wish thank you a wonderful you. afternoon. Thank you very much. And I wish and, you a nice afternoon as well. And, and uh, many more uh, great interviews. It's very nice that you're taking some time uh, for us artists and you know oh, researching you. and giving us this space on your uh, Thank you channel very much. Thank you very much no i appreciate you uh your words thank you very much okay nick i'll speak to you hopefully soon yeah goodbye. again okay bye